our youth here. Uh, it's uh, is about the Kosovo youth. Always the question is: Is Europe united, and what should we or should we expect something from Europe in the future? I would say that it um, it uh, makes a lot of sense to me to talk about and to think about politically. Is the gap that we do have as young generations when it comes to our knowledge about history and political transformation that Europe has been going through? The, um, the fact of being aware about the past and making young people more proactive in the policy making cycle, because in any case that we do feel unsatisfied with this socioeconomic context, the nationalistic rhetoric uh, goes higher and it's very difficult then to work. With. Never before we got a chance to see how young people are not aware of their responsibilities of uh, for their attitude, for the choices they make, for, for how much cautious they are, for how much they respect the measures and stuff like that. And I believe that's not just because they like to disobey the system, but it's because they lack education and they lack um, knowledge and they lack um, critical thinking. And I think here, specifically in North Macedonia and perhaps the Western Balkans in general, our young people have many priorities such as, let's say, improvement in terms of their education, their employability, their, uh, their participation in decision-making processes. Uh, also here in the Western Balkans, the youth migration continues to be a serious. Different questions like uh, young people, youngsters in a digital revolution in new century, and uh, also the question of uh, economic issues. And what I would suggest, and uh, that is how to further improve democratic capacities uh, of young people across Europe and how to preserve the liberal order that we already regard. But I believe right now uh, a very political topic uh, which is pressing to, to the youngsters in the European Union and also to Western Balkans and other countries in Europe is the dealing with the coronavirus crisis. but democracy and the rule of law first. So opening these chapters or the new clusters first and uh, closing these chapters and clusters uh, the last. The political nature of the process um, should be that there are more high level meetings also with member states so that there is a more commitment by the member states of the European Union to discuss enlargement policy with not only um, ministers uh, of the Western Balkan Six, but also with uh, civil society and other stakeholders to have a stronger exchange also between the most relevant in mind uh, to really include opinions, point of views, and your ideas in shaping the future of the European Union, and not only talking uh, um, among the 27 member states, but also uh, taking into account and into consideration the opinions of of the countries and people living in countries. Um, opportunistic about get, being a part of the European Union. Uh, today they are not as much as they used to be because of many, many issues that the European Union... the EU has, um, let's say, has led down the people of the Balkans quite many times, uh, especially when it comes to uh, for instance, uh, visa liberalization for uh, Kosovo, uh, we have we have fulfilled all the, the what has been asked from us. However, um, we have not uh, been given what we were promised. So it it is understandable that people are losing faith uh, in the EU. And in one way, people are looking for alternatives, like uh, turning to other other uh, big power. I think is the fact that they are carrying on a part of responsibility, I mean the EU institutions, together with the, with the countries which are going to be involved. So this intensifying process of the relations among EU member countries and non-EU member countries, these um, systematic dynamics among political elites, the fact that we will be more involved in the discussions as contributors or um, at least giving our opinion or input upon the matter, I think it, 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 
matters a lot and it didn't happen before. Reforms yeah. in the, um, with the aim of integration in the EU and, and, and the session process is really done. Um, something that is missing is cooperation and consultation with, with youth structures in general or, or with civil society at all. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have a pretty um, separated U European integration process, which goes, okay, we have the agency for it, which is dealing only with that on, on national level, uh, but it is not uh, well connected with the civil Baruch Spinoza was one of the greatest philosophers when he was talking about morals and reality. So it's good to have morals, but in the end of the day, if they are not backed up in the, rea in the reality, they are going to put us through a very fake transformation. And I think the question in our region has never been about how well we are performing or how strict, strict the rules should be, but the fact that we do not possess the means to go through those strict steps. The process. So uh, all of the countries can be can become uh, member states tomorrow, but how our realities will change, except that we will have the ability to move somewhere else. I work in the engineer in the unit there that deals with the regional cooperation and regional program. As you probably know, we, we think in the European Union that civil society is an absolutely essential player for, for building uh, democracy, building sustainable societies, building inclusive societies, uh, building effective societies. And um, therefore, we do put a lot of financial support into into the sector in the Western Balkans and Turkey and also around the world. Um, if you are familiar with our, our financial support, uh, it runs over, you know, when you have the IPA 1, the IPA 2, and now coming into the IPA 3. And over this period of 2014 to 2020, we've channeled 330 million euro to civil society and media. We, we deal with these two topics sort of in the same uh, programming process, one could say. And um, we do this based on, uh, uh, our support is formulated on, on three areas of, of priority. One is to support building of an enabling environment for civil society, one where civil society can express themselves freely, where they can have uh, funding to, to operate, where they can uh, maybe have tax rebates and, and special rules on, on taxation and, and things like that. Uh, then uh, there's also a lot of attention to building the capacity of civil society itself to be this player that you, you, the civil society needs to be, which means that uh, you have to be accountable, you have to be effective as well, you have to be sustainable, finding ways of uh, representing a constituency of civil society. It's to, to be there in a, one role, to be a watchdog, looking at what's happening and pointing out a problem uh, or, or good things for that matter, but following what's going on and create debate around, around that. Then it is also to be this famous link between citizens in, in, in general and individually and and the governments and I think in that role you cannot that requires a certain representative the fact that we would really appreciate and we want to push forward to perceive youth as a specific target group with very mm -hmm. specific needs I'm aware that the Commission is supporting uh, the latest project of RCC regional cooperation council on the mm -hmm. youth labs which will be a project dedicated to the youth participation 
on talking about important issues, which uh, enlargement and being part of European Union is one of them. Mm -hmm. So the big question there is how are we going to include those youngsters which are part of disadvantaged areas, mm -hmm. are part of disadvantaged groups, are not in the circles in which we are used to work, mm -hmm. are not getting any information about things that we do know about data analysis and narratives. So this is a crucial point for us. And we would be very happy with, if we can develop mechanisms that from the youth perspective, you've got to know as commission, as institution, where to uh, put some, let's say, um, uh, highlights or, or, or to, to improve the work from Brussels in order to fit to our local. So one of the things we have tried to do, uh, that we're, it's a new program that we're going to start. We have um, a cooperation that we do together with UNDP, it's on local democracy. It's working to create better links between civil society and local authorities, both to sort of almost like a confidence building between, between the two for local authorities to see that uh, civil society can be, uh, you know, something that's useful for them and that can help provide services that need to be provided to, to the populations and so on. And also for civil society to have more confidence that financial resources channeled from local authorities are done so in a transparent way and then in a correct way. And so we've been doing this for several years. It's called Reload. I actually, this person was also in Podgorica now that I remember. And uh, what we have added, we've added a, a component on youth to this project. It will be the next phase starting at the end of this year, beginning of next year. And we wanted really there to focus exactly on this group that you, you mentioned, those that are not necessarily already engaged, but to give opportunities maybe even for local um, uh, internships, for local solidarity projects, bringing people who may not, young people who may not yet be engaged in any civil society organization to bring them into, into this work. So we have quite a lot of hopes that, that this will be very interesting. So that's, that's one, one. I would say that we as youth organizations need serious, like not only support, but also we need to, to find a way in which we can uh, reach out and also present the programs as beneficial. But also we need to carry in mind something else, that all those soft skills we are um, offering, and all those uh, activities related to soft skills, entrepreneurship, media literacy, everything that is uh, trendy, trendy is a bad word here, but what it's, uh, what it's happening around and what we think is useful uh, could not be as useful for the rural, rural young people in mm -hmm. particular areas. So we need to see what mm -hmm. they really need, uh, be that... Uh, from, from that perspective, it's really important is uh, especially for youth marginalized groups, is for other youngsters to, to um, really fight for them not being marginalized and to include them and to be inclusive at that, at that moment. Something which is really uh, hard to expect is for marginalized groups to, to organize themselves more efficiently and uh, uh, to come on their own uh, on some good ways to be represented because that's the whole point of, of, of yeah. me trying to include them. So I, I really take all of this on board. It's really helpful and it's inspiring to, to hear from you. And I, I think it's really very interesting because it makes it concrete. I think you youth organizations, we've had a lot of exchanges like the one we're, we're having now and you, there's been debates with the commissioner and, and so on. But I think that youth organizations feel that we're repeating a little bit the same thing about what is needed and so on. And this feels in a way quite concrete, you know, that because uh, these are small things that, you know, can be done uh, also on a, small, on a small scale. And if many people do it, <laughs> it can still have a big impact. So it's, it's quite attractive in, in, in that sense as well. And it would be nice to see and to be part of, of uh, helping the youth organizations to go in, in that direction also in, in, the, in the countries. context that we find ourselves presently in, it's also very much a time for reflection, right? Um, 
you you signaled that you know it would be important to integrate youth voices you know in um, EU enlargement uh, process, reform process of the EU. And now it's actually a really good time for that. Why? Because we're discussing the future of the, of the European Union now, the future. Here we go. Uh, so with regards to millennials, there's a lot of misconcessions out there, right? You know, we speak about myths and realities, and most of the perceptions are quite negative with regards to the millennial uh, generation. Uh, lazy, apathetic, these are words that usually uh, we hear about, you know, this generation. Uh, and my contribution for today's discussion is to see the ways in which we can ask progressives uh, better engage uh, with the segment of society. Millennials, people just like, it's not that they believe that politics is broke. They do believe in, in politics, right? They understand that politics uh, runs the system, but nevertheless, they also say, hey, but the system can be improved. And, you know, I, I do tend to, 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 to agree to this. Um, and, you know, there's, there's also examples where there was an uptake by progressive politics on, on these recommendations um, from more of a, a, a personal. Uh these young people and I think it's very important to divide them in specific groups because with all the latest developments that we have been going through especially with those techn technological and digital ones uh, we can see the differences between generations even when you are talking about young people so uh, us which do work every day um, in the youth sector we perceive and we understand that uh, generations have changed so much and you have always to adopt and to see how uh, you can efficiently communicate uh, the programs, the, uh, the values uh, and all, all the, the important, let's say, things that you want to communicate uh, them. So uh, when we talk about inclusion of the youngsters to the political life, to the electoral process, we always talk about voting, uh, but uh, I really think that we we need to do more, uh, to speak more with political parties, to, pe uh, to put young uh, people at the list. And uh, to, because we always give uh, opportunity to the youngsters to vote for some elder people, but uh, is there a choice for young people to young p people represent them? Uh, I mean... Oh, it's like, as progressive parties, we also need to dare more democracy. We need to dare more criticism. We need to dare to be more open. Of manifestos that this structure is always included and always has a voice, always has the possibility to raise an issue, contribute with amendments, what have you. So I don't know how it is in your country. You say that there's this, this, this distancing, this detachment, right? Um, but for instance, I would say that this, this structure is a good example of how, you know, closeness can also bring greater opportunities for you to, you know, raise your issues and have, have your voices heard. Um, and again, what is actually expected from, you know, uh, the youth wing of a party is for you to be uh, vocal, critical and energetic, you know. Uh, and it needs to be dosed in a way, of course, right? Because you don't want to, uh, let's say, uh, annoy too much to the point that you're just sidelined or from the debate or not taking into account. So, you know, uh, do, do, the do measure matters, politics matters. Uh, but then again, um, the youth sections of parties and uh, probably also in your countries, uh, in your organizations, in your structures, um, you're faced, uh, I would say, with uh, similar, similar dilemmas or issues. Uh, but nev nevertheless, um, there's always, I would say, you know, space for you to, to, to speak up. Um, and if there's not the space there, you should uh, try in, in, 
in, in, in various ways to create the space for... When we actually analyze the statistics, we see that uh, the trust in the European Union has been on the highest level since 2010, if I'm not mistaken. And then even though um, there are some new um, methods of political participation that, that young people perceive, they're still becoming more aware of the um, of actually voting, especially in the in the uh, European Parliament uh, elections. And I think the turn the turnout was something around like forty percent or or something. Um, you turn out in the yeah, yeah in the in the last elections, and then you would kind of like think okay, so there is a rise in trust, and there is um, there are more young people who are voting, and you would say, okay, that's probably because, you know, the European Union is uh, based on some values and uh, on its liberal order and, um, you know, young people are definitely, you know, seeing the benefits of it and want to, to maintain it. But then on the other hand, we see this sharp rise in, in the support to the right wing um, political parties and to Euros Euroskeptics. Um, especially in some EU member states where young people are actually the key supporter for, for um, these parties. So I'm, I'm... approaches that we should think upon uh, to make uh, young people more politically engaged and more politically aware, which the first one is uh, including uh, political education in the classical educational system and invest more in that aspect. And on the other hand, from the politician side, uh, they should be more, let's say, um, near to the young people and to the young generation by using all these new tools, digital tools, the advancement of technology in order to find channels of communication with them because it's a deficit from both sides and uh, the approaches should be complementary. So because being young is not only something that's, um, that has um, the question that, that we all not only deal with the question of youth participation, we also have ideas on different topics. For example, when it comes to environmental policies, we see that it's youth that um, is on the streets um, all over Europe um, and they demand us to act as politicians, um, but they don't have a voice in all this. Um, but this, I think it's um, very important that we also always, when we start um, processes of transformation within Europe, we have to um, also support our friends in the Western Balkans to also be part of, um, of this change. Um, the fact that even in countries in transition, which are building their democracy and building themselves and their economies, as well to those which are well established, I mean, in the economical terms and political terms, we can see a kind of um, uh, apathism of young people to participate and to be politically engaged. And in both cases, for different reasons. The first ones that are, uh, it's our story, is because we are struggling to find ourselves and we are struggling to be a, a kind of substantial part of, of policy making, to make politicians aware about uh, upon our needs and to make them count in our uh, potential. On the other countries which are well established, uh, I mean, they have uh, well established democracies, they are developed, maybe things are so well developed that young people have lost the interest to be proactive in the policy. And um, I think it's, um, it's very hard to address um, a young generation uh, with that and also to have um, something like a solidarity being formed in our generation because we all always learned that um, we live in an individual society and everyone has um, their own um, their own um, way of, of coping things and we always learned uh, as a generation to be um, individ individual and not to to organize as a collective and I think this is a big challenge we we have um, to redefine uh, as a as a generation 
because um, of course we see some some first um, developments that might be um, better uh, in organizing use for example the Fridays for Future movement, but we, when we look at the Fridays for Future movement, that uh, it's just a special kind of young people uh, organizing, middle class, uh, well-educated parents uh, who are organizing this. So I think this is a, a challenge, um, and, uh, and to this challenge, I think it's also always important to say that youth is not a homogen thing. We have different uh, people. But I also always would say um, that being young again is not a political uh, agenda. Um, I, I can tell you, with we have a we have a very very right wing um, young um, MEP uh, who is not progressive and who, who is not um, I don't think representing youth, but he's still young. So uh, I, we 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 always have to tend that being young is not um, a political. Um, notion but it's also um, um, a perspective and I don't know if youth participation is, um, is the solution uh, in the fight against corruption but of course it's also uh, it's a tool to to make um, young people being aware on political processes and also maybe to to um, enlighten the anger on on how political um, processes are, are doing and with the ambition to, to change them then. I think it was really inspiring because we had a chance to talk to someone who's of our age, who's a young person, and yet who's um, involved in decision-making processes within a huge decision-making body, such as European Parliament. I think it was really useful to um, exchange opinions and experiences uh, regarding some burning issues that we are facing here in the Western Balkans, such as corruption, uh, nepotism, uh, or migrations, etc. But I think that it was also and it is relieving from time to time to hear that such problems are also problems of to have some representation of uh, uh, a specific group in this sense young people if you want to achieve some uh, good changes uh, in policies we need to have constant communication between politicians who are making some decisions and the civil society who will make a constant push with lots of expertise and knowledge uh, in this we do have same issues which do concern young people, but when it comes to organizational aspect or uh, to our position towards the institution and society, uh, we face a lot of challenges which other national youth structures do not. Basically, uh, the European Youth Forum, first of all, uh, it's very interesting to, to know that the policies are being made with the consultation of the member organizations. So basically, all the member organizations are the ones who are involved in making our strategies and policies, and they could influence. Uh, in the way how we will represent them. So this is the first thing to know. And also, uh, it's very useful that you you know that you could influence even with uh, the position of not only the, the concrete member, but also the uh, the one who is aiming to become a member. Basically, I think that our big fight will be to continue our work uh, uh, to, under, to, to explain that we must have uh, space and position to, to, to speak about the, the, the youth issues and to continue working on, on youth policies. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the situation we, uh, we are facing, but also um, to be aware of the fact that young people are also suffering a lot from, from everything that we are living today. And I always like to, to speak about the topic of the mental health of young people who has been affected a lot in the recent uh, few months because we are living in the times of uncertainty and young people are the ones who are suffering a lot of that thing that they are not aware. Uh, they don't know what's going to happen with their uh, college, what, how they will continue their education, will it, will it be uh, enough quality?
community in everything what's happening online also with the transition how the transition from the uh, school to the labor market will happen in the situation where we are having so many um, people in a quite difficult times where many things are being endangered and many things are also being questioned and we will see how it's gonna gonna be but definitely we as the european youth forum will continue our our fight for first of all more youth participation youth uh, policies but also uh, within all our political work, it will also be the Western Balkans and the position of the Western Balkans in, in the negotiations and the processes. From my perspective, European Youth Forum exists because of its members. And basically, if you don't have strong members, uh, European Youth Forum is not strong. And all our advocacy work will be without any kind of influence.